How many in this room uh, were present during World War II? Uh, a good number, yes. So you share my history. My history began in 1930. So I was uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, up to six, six, 15 when the atom bomb was dropped. So I have a big responsibility, uh, a lifelong awareness of, of this. So uh, it took me a long time to be able to focus on it. But uh, so I'd like to read something that will uh, touch some, and maybe surprise those of you who have lived through World War II, and for those who haven't, your history will be refreshed, perhaps. It's a short letter from General Douglas MacArthur. So this is a letter that he wrote, which I think will be very revealing of the whole start and continuation of the nuclear issue, okay? Now, I know that this is going to, <clears throat> and it affects all of us everywhere and the entire planet, but I know your particular interests are diverse and they are, but in many ways related to this overarching presence of nuclearism in our world, which has not yet been stopped after 70 years. <clears throat> this is a letter <clears throat> that he wrote in March of 1962. And he writes it to a professor in a university in Ohio who obviously was maybe teaching history and wrote to him to get his views. And he says, uh, dear professor, I have received your letter of March 15th and read it with deep interest. My records are not immediately available to me and consequently, I will reply to your queries in general terms. Japan realized defeat was inevitable. As early as September of 1944. That's a significant fact that I didn't know until I read this letter. Perhaps, uh, okay. When we initiated the recapture and liberation of the Philippines. This enabled us to interdict by sea and air her essential supplies from the south of oil, rubber, nickel, tin, and other war materials. This blockade, uh, <clears throat> together with her air vulnerability, she was losing all her planes and ammunition, uh, made her ultimate destruction a certainty as far back as September 1944. She was anxious for peace, and the Pacific War should have ended several months before it did. In my opinion, there was a monumental failure of statescraft on the part of the Allies in not consummating this end. Thank you for your awareness of this. My own professional views as to the weakness of the enemy were well known. Though my operation, no, excuse me, through my operational and intelligence divisions, colloquially known as G3 and G2, I made daily reports to the Army Chief of Staff. I was not consulted about the use of the atom bomb. Had I been, I would have expressed the view that it was unnecessary, that Japan was already prepared to surrender. I trust this gives you the information you requested. So for those who, to, for whom this is new, I think it's essential for us to add this to our awareness that history has been uh, mistold. 
we have this is not in the history books according to the American curricula. Uh, I know. Say that as the daughter of an American history professor, so so even we. I happen to live three minutes away from the physics building at Columbia University. We moved there in 1937 in Manhattan from another place. So when I was seven, eight, nine, our next door neighbor was, we knew, a professor of biological physics, whatever that is, and he would come for cocktails across the hall to our apartment and there his visitors would come to us while they were cooking the dinner. Very close relationship. All we knew about Dr. Hecht was that he was doing something at Columbia that he could not tell his wife or his daughter. To us, this was incomprehensible. We loved Dr. Hecht. We couldn't imagine our father not telling our mother everything he did during the day. And us, at supper time, we would hear what happened. We couldn't imagine a secret between a husband and a wife and a father and a daughter. That's my memory from, from then on. It was a secret. Uh, but it was an awareness something evil must be happening. You know, this is not right. And it wasn't until well after the war, 1950, that we began connecting what Dr. Hecht was doing with the, the I mean, that's 10 years later, you know? So it was a very slow and gradual. The history, the secrecy was unbelievable from the very start, from 1943, when 6,000 to 60,000 women were brought to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It was all women because the men were all in the army, weren't they, in 1943. The draft was on. There were no men available. Oak Ridge, Los Alamos in New Mexico, the women came and did the building. One person did not know what the next person was doing the secrecy, and you can read about that in an amazing book called The Girls of Atomic City, an amazing story of the higgledy-piggledy construction. You know, this war uh, machine was so rapid. and The buildings were put up before the paths and the roads of Oak Ridge, which is a valley between the two ridges, this uh, facility called Oak Ridge Y-12 with one mission. Its mission, it was built to produce the highly enriched uranium. We've heard so much about that in the last few years, about the possibility of Iran having the capacity to build this. They must. And we know they don't want to, and they don't. I mean, they're not. I mean, who, and that's my interpretation. But this was what all that Oak Ridge, Tennessee was building in 1943. So uh, anyway, to t make a long story short, after, oh, you know, there is a large peace movement. Uh, thanks, Paul. There's a large peace movement, as you know, of the plowshares and others, anti-nuclear, doing direct action to try to stop the continuing production, development, invention, improvement, and storage of nuclear weapons that has never stopped, despite 19, uh, 1970s stricture internationally, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty signed and effective and legally accepted because the United States is has is subservient to and it respects, I mean, is, is obliged to obey international laws, treaties, agreements, and principles. This has never stopped. The proliferation has never stopped in the, as we sit here, probably in Russia too, because Russia is also uh, keeping up with the Joneses. 
I suppose. Anyway, so we uh, were part of a group uh, like Paul. Uh, they began in 1980 trying to make a scream of protest over nuclear weapons. Uh, Phil Berrigan was one, and Elizabeth McAllister, the two, who, and seven or eight or nine others uh, in the first plowshares action, which happened in direct uh, op uh, opposition to the nuclear weapons uh, construction and facility. It happened to be at one of the satellite places. And Paul, in 1984, as a young man, was also engaged in, which number was that? The that was the Pershing plowshares was the eighth of the plowshares so the, actions. So by 1984, there had been eight plowshares actions. I was in Las Vegas trying to help the community called the Nevada Desert Experience because the state of Nevada contained the Nevada Desert. And that Nevada Desert has been used since 1950 to test by meaning dropping or pushing underground 1,000 atom bombs. Just testing. And they knew it would work after July 16, 1945. The first atom bomb was dropped in the New Mexico desert, wonderful white sands desert, Alamogordo, on the 16th of July, 1945, two weeks or so, three weeks before they used it at Nagasaki on the 6th of August. Did they need to use it in Nagasaki on the 6th of August? No, they had already seen what it did and most of the observers said it never needs to be done ever again. It should be stopped immediately and so J. Robert Oppenheimer was the brilliant scientist who was accepted to be in charge of the program at Los Alamos, which actually invented, put together that first bomb that was called the Trinity Bomb uh, that was tested on the 16th of July, 1945. He, early on, was against it because he was a true professional scientist and said this information should be shared with Russia, with the rest of the world under uh, intellectual honesty. But of course he was extremely monitored and threatened and controlled and, and, and he, he uh, colluded in that and uh, compromised in order to get it finished to prove we can't judge the his motivation on it, but he was a genuinely professional scientist. <clears throat> and so they did have it all put together and they were ready to test it, and they did, and they saw that it worked, and so from then on, they were against ever using it. So they had to be lied to, and it was said, we will only drop it in the Pacific to show as a sign. And we know that that, not even General MacArthur <laughs> was told that it was really going to be used. Very few people made that decision that it would be dropped on a city and po people, human population. Same, and they, you know, so the whole thing is secrecy and evil and it had a purpose and the interpretation by J. Robert Oppenheimer was, it will become a gold rush. And that is what he said. You can read his, auto, his biography, not his autobiography, published in 2008 or nine, the latest biography. So here we are 70 years later, and we're all in it together it's on our shoulders. We're all responsible in some way to do what we can uh, to end this fiasco.
And, and as I told you, of the gold rush, to keep the gold rush rushing in Nevada, they were, the whole setup was made to begin testing as far back as 1950, two or three years. They had to use these weapons that they were making, keep it going, keep up the appropriations by the federal government, keep up the lobbying by the contractors, gradually the thing will escalate and we had that experience. I moved there in 2005 five, and stayed in this community that monitored and tried to create awareness of the testing that was going on uh, as a very small group inviting people from all over the country, welcoming people from visit the test site and be as close as they could and see the desert and experience what was happening almost monthly to get a thousand tests, 100 first between 1950 and 1963 from the air. 100 above ground tests. Then in the Kennedy 1963, there was an international ban on t above ground testing of nuclear weapons. It was observed. So a new industry grew up, an industry to dig into the sacred ground of the desert holes, uh, incalculably deep, uh, with elevators and everything else, to drop the bomb way down under the ground and explode it, the next 900 over the next 40 uh, years, until 1993, from 63 to 93. Every six weeks or so, they would test another underground from the generation of weapons that were made more powerful all the time. So that's the story. And, and we learned that gradually. I'm telling it to you in how many minutes? <laughs> 15 minutes. But maybe some of you knew it, and maybe so, to you it's a, a new story of a crazy thing that's been going on, unstopped. So by secrecy, by secrecy, always by secrecy. And so that's why this little group was so valuable, but it was very little and very underfunded. And, you know, so the Nevada Desert Experience were the main group of people hosting, bringing students, all sorts of people, to the test site and hearing the story, helping to get it known. And, and that, we did that until about 2011, and then that was after the last action, which was 2009, the end of 2009. And we felt that there needed to be another direct action to expose this. So that's why uh, six or seven or eight of us, we went around and to, consulted the various communities around the country where there were nuclear facilities and communities of people trying to expose and oppose what was happening at Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore in California, Kansas City in Missouri, or Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two of them. One's Kansas City, Kansas, and the other is Kansas City, Missouri, right there. They have a large facility, which they have just enlarged four times the original one, which was decadently polluted and, and aging. And in the last three years, they have built up something four times as big as the one that was built around 1950-55. So they have a brand new facility which puts together all the non-nuclear components of every bomb, which is 87% of every bomb. Uh, and Kansas City, the non-nuclear. So that's it. And, and, and now we have these places. Oak Ridge for the fuel, which ignites the actual bomb, which becomes a thermonuclear explosion, constantly making these fuel, these pits, we call them. They're like softballs full of highly enriched uranium, which will produce the plutonium, which will Ign the explosion in which with, in the bomb will ignite the 
tritium or the hydro, the, the um, hydrogen part of the bomb, which makes it so extremely powerful now, up to 1,000 times, even more than that, actually, uh, the power of the Nagasaki bomb now. Enough for one or two to destroy the planet if there was a, a use of them. Because of the nuclear winter that would be created, the uh, environment, as well as would gradually ex wipe out the human family and all of life in, t in 10 years at least would just be the end of everything. And that's sitting with us right now, sitting here as we speak. It's going on, unstopped, okay? And uh, the numbers are growing and the quantity is growing. <laughs> despite the non-proliferation treaty and other, of course, humanitarian laws. I mean, it's, it's criminal activity. So our action was to expose the crimes of this facility, and we felt we had to do it. We're always uh, uh, responsible, every one of us, in some way, if we know a crime, to expose it and oppose it. So we saw ourselves as just doing was our normal routine, and we were able to do that because we suspected that after 70 years, things, the spirit would not be there, and it wasn't. We found the place very empty. We were able to get in in 15 minutes once we got there. Getting through the woods was, took about two hours, and then getting at, that through the first fence was in the woods, so that was 15 minutes or less, five minutes, just cutting a little you know, right angle cut in the chain link fence we crawled through and continued through the woods up to the top down the other side till we could see the facility in front of us and no, all lit up like daylight at 4.30 in the morning and by quarter to five it was still dark but light and we were able to get through three fences similar chain linked no electronics working just cut through the same simple hole five minutes we were in and then we were able to spend about 10 to 15 minutes at the most labeling the building with the truth, with slogans of truth, spray paint. We carried in symbolic vials of human blood that people who would have liked to be with us asked us to use as a symbol, a quick sign, a message. This is life-threatening. This has uh, uh, exterminated hundreds of thousands of people. This will exterminate hundreds of thousands of people. Everything that's in this building. Well, we didn't know what the building really was. I didn't, nor did my, uh, Greg. I mean, Michael, my companion, our... But Michael had read uh, other books about it, and he knew the geography of the facility, and he knew this was the warehouse for the highly enriched uranium storage. And enough was there to make 10,000 bombs. And that was three, almost three years ago. So it's been functioning. So how many can we make today? I mean, it's just non unstopped. They're still making it every day. Highly enriched uranium into this fuel. So where does the money come from? 57% of the budget of the United States goes into the military, and a big portion of that is sustaining this nuclear industry. And who really gets it? The contractors, the CEOs, not the workers, of course. You know? So. We felt it was a very good thing to do, and we're very glad that we were able to get that message across. So we, we finished doing what we needed to do, and uh, we were, began collecting, and we saw this van, the first van that we had seen go, come and go before we entered, slowly coming in the facility inside the fences. And the, this building might be, I don't know, I say 300 meters long. It was very long, no windows, no doors, just a blank wall with a roof on our side. So 
So the, the van came along and we lit our candles, more symbols, candles symbolize light and light symbolizes truth. And we also had bread as friendship to show our love for the people who were there. And uh, we had roses to remember the white rose people in Munich, uh, the resistance to war symbol. We brought it in so you were represented. And then um, we, we brought um, bread. What else did we bring? Uh, plus the messages on the wall. We had put uh, crime scene tape, uh, something like this. You know, I had a whole roll of something like this. I found this since I've been here. But instead of these pictures, there was a space. It just said, danger. So uh, we changed the space uh, wherever we could to nuclear crime scene. So we had labeled the building with nuclear crime scene printed spatially all along the way. It was actually orange, but we were able to do that in the five to seven to 12 minutes that we were able to be active. So thank you, Paul. So uh, that right is a visual aid, pardon? Did I put you on the right page? Yeah, I, yeah, I do have a few things that you know, I've read MacArthur's letter. I've told you about the action, and uh, we did say that from maybe I didn't from 1943 to 2015, ten trillion dollars has been spent on maintaining this industry, but of course most of it has gone into the profiteering, because it was all so simply built. We could get through the fences. They were so untechnical, un shall we say. I mean, it was a place of nothing well built. I mean, what you have here is, <laughs> is a mansion. So um, 10 trillion, this is the reason why life in the United States and in the world is as it is, because what could be done with $10 trillion in 70 years? It's, it's unimaginable. And now we have appropriated another trillion to maintain all of this and expand it and uh, modernize it. And they call it life extension program another trillion to keep it alive until 2080. So what do you call it? Nobody, how many people knew this? How many of you knew this? So let them know. Some, one person does know it. So you can see it's very difficult information, isn't it? It's, nobody knows it in the United States. I mean, I'm always, we are always say, telling them what they have never heard and can't imagine, you know. And then you walk through the city, for instance, of Buff Baltimore. Total, I mean, it would approach, um, <clears throat> not Munich, but what was the most bombed out city in Germany? Uh, which? Okay, you know, just Devon. And, and these houses are still there, but they're boarded up, and the streets are decaying. Vines are growing up over the wall. This is in the last, uh, less than a month ago, I had a slow walk with two Austrian journalists through the streets of Baltimore, so it's freshly new to me. Here you have a city, and you hear about these uh, big uprisings in Baltimore lately. I mean, you know, naturally, the people are incensed. And, trying to live, no, nobody has jobs, 25% unemployed or more. Mm -hmm. And, and it, was, it, was, it is a scandal, and that's only one. There are many more. You know. yeah. So um, that's, that's about that. I, I think I just have a little, announce, um, you know, a little uh, list here of things to tell you before you begin asking questions. Um, I think I've mentioned it all. <laughs>